Run the race not only for the prize But as those who've gone before us Let us leave to all behind us Let us leave for honor Passed on through godly lives Oh, may all who come behind us Find us faithful May the fire of our devotion Light their way May the footprints that we leave Lead them to believe And the lives we live Inspire them to obey Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. After all, our hopes and dreams have come and gone, and our children sift through all we've left behind may the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we each must find oh may all who come behind us find us faithful May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe. And the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. That ought to be the prayer of every one of our people. It's amazing how fast time slips away. It's unbelievable. Some of these pictures uh, and the activities that they were uh, taken in, um, some of them come as a surprise. You know, you forget things. But uh, thank the Lord for all these years that God has been a special blessing to us. I'd like to have at this time our ministers and their wives and evangelists, those sitting down here to come up on the platform, file up here. I want this congregation to get a good look at some of the finest people on the face of the earth. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. One item of special significance. Um, you know, Brother States and some of our, our men have preached over the years in camp meetings and a lot of messages are out there on tapes. Brother States' son, Larry, uh, found some of those old tapes and uh, passed them on to someone that, that played them uh, on the internet. And lo and behold, there have been almost 300 different people in different countries of the world that have ordered those tapes or downloaded those tapes and listen to his fiery evangelistic preaching. Amen. Somebody sent him a list of those and I was, I was really shocked, uh, Brother States, to find out how many different countries. There were South Africa, Australia, just different parts of the world where somehow they heard about um, this Pilgrim Holiness preacher and uh, so He's still preaching around the world. And I think that's tremendous. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. Is brother and sister Sneed here? Where are they? 
Brother, Brother Sneed, would you come? It's, it's, a, it's a special blessing to me to have Brother James Sneed and Sister Sneed. Uh, I, we've been uh, in meetings and so forth where, you know, we've kept our friendship alive. I always did love just kidding Sister Sneed. It's, uh, it's hard to get one over on her. And her son-in-law gave her a good name. It was Peanut. And uh, we've just had a good time kidding her over the years. Have a special love and appreciation for Brother Sneed and Sister Sneed. And so glad that in the providence of the Lord they were able to come. Leroy and Cheryl saw that they were here this weekend. Um, one of the first evangelistic revival meetings that we ever had in the state of Illinois, Patsy and I came over from Frankfurt Pilgrim College and Alan was a little guy in a stroller. I remember Sharon pushing him down the road in Mason, Illinois. And uh, anyway, Brother Sneed was one of the, the first uh, pastors to um, thought they'd give a Kentucky preacher a chance to not ruin his church. But uh, what a blessing it was, and we formed a friendship over the years. Brother Sneed was our first uh, vice president of our conference, and for... Um, when Brother Gray resigned uh, way back there, Brother Sneed served as conference president for about nine months until a conference election. And um, in that particular conference year, uh, they elected a 27-year-old that didn't know what he was doing. But uh, it's a real blessing to have Brother and Sister Sneed here. I'd like to have Brother Sneed to give a word of testimony. We love you, Brother. <laughs> Just give us a word. Well, it's good to be here in the house of God this day. Looking back over the uh, many occasions that that I remember, once I once I see the picture, I saw somebody a while back I was talking, and I said uh, uh, that, that there, there's a lot of jewels in there. <laughs> yes. And I thank God for them. Thank God for friends. I love and appreciate them. Amen. Now, I'm, I'm kind of a, what I've always uh, t told somebody. I said, uh, I'm really too independent to be in a denomination. <laughs> so, really, I, I feel that way. And I, we hold no regrets nowhere. And we, Praise God. We're just... Pressing on to the glory of God. Amen. I was thinking about the old song there, the cross, and the, the cross, and out of the cross comes the blood. Yes. The blood, the blood is all my plea. I plunge and all it cleanses me. Praise, Praise God. The Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Lord bless you, brother. Bless your heart. Amen. Amen. Appreciate brother and sister's need. Praise God. Praise the Lord. All right, I'd like to have Brother, Brother Gray to come at this time. And uh, we're going to sit down across the table from each other, if we can get these mics to work. And one of our younger pastors is going to um, ask some questions, and um, Brother Gray is going to give you some answers, and I'm going to try to help fill in the, the blank spots. A lot of the, our history, some of us forget, but our young people need to know some of the things that's brought us to this point after nearly uh, after 40 years amen first question that we'd like to ask is, how did our conference come into existence? Who do you want to answer that? Oh, great. All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's because I'm the oldest. All right. Really, our conference came to ex in existence by not any pre-planning by anyone. 
I held a meeting in uh, Binghamton, New York in the fall of 1966. Reverend James McLaren was the pastor there. And when he went there, he said, I want you to hold me a meeting. I said, oh, no. He said, oh, yes. So I obeyed my elders and went for a revival meeting. Uh, Naoma wheeled in it at that time, and Nancy were the singers during that meeting. And uh, we had a good meeting. But during that meeting, Brother McLaren and I was exchanging some thoughts that uh, things were taking place out in the Midwest and that would affect us and with the merger coming on which all of us were very much well acquainted with and some principles of God's Word that we felt were very viable still true that they had taught us that would be no longer be in, be in effect so I was talking to Brother McLaren and he was talking to me and I said I don't think uh, some of the fellows back in the Midwest will be going into the merger. They loved the men, and uh, as I left the council that I sat on, I told the men, and I hugged their neck and wept on their shoulders, that it was nothing personal, but uh, we had to try to salvage. I felt like I had to try to salvage my family and uh, those that I was responsible for. I, uh, in, that, uh, in that conversation, he said, why don't you talk to the New York Pilgrims and uh, see if they're ready to reach out across their borders. So I, he made a call to Brother Whitney, who was the uh, president at that time of the New York Conference. They called a council meeting, and I went and met with the council. And uh, as I presented what I was thinking, uh, Brother Faye said, uh, you know, I've been thinking a long time and felt like God was directing us to make a move and reach out across our borders. And so out of that meeting, we made arrangements. The revival I was holding closed, and I flew back to Bloomington, uh, Bloomington Illinois. And uh, from that point, they got in their cars later and came out and we arranged a meeting in Bloomington, Illinois, right in the very same little church that's back there on the, on the bulletin board. And uh, we met in that building. They, uh, the people that owned it allowed us to meet there. Brother Sullivan, you can well remember, that place was packed. Uh, when Brother Whitney and O.L. Fay and Brother Richmond and Brother Bidwell came out, that's part of the New York Council, and uh, we met together. Had a, God just settled down on that meeting in a, in a gracious way. And out of that meeting, New York decided to set up a committee out in the Midwest, and uh, they appointed uh, Brother John Yant, that's gone on to heaven. He was our advisor. Brother Sutherland was the secretary. and. Uh, I became the chairman, and uh, we fellows began to uh, formulate and talk about what to do and how to expand our work because others were getting in contact with us. And I think from that, that was our early, early beginning. Okay, thank you. Brother Sullivan, in our 40-year history, where have our different camp meetings been held? After. After we um, had the meeting with the New York Brethren at Bloomington, and by the way, the Decatur Church and the Bloomington Church are about uh, 45, 50 miles um, apart, uh, Bloomington being north. And um, uh, it was I was just a young preacher in my first pastorate out of Bible school, and there were some sweeping changes that were taking place in the fellowship. Uh, and one did not know who to trust didn't know where to turn and um, I can remember uh, observing uh, brother gray and uh, his people in fact in zone rallies we began to fellowship together and uh, there was a trust that began to, to build and confidence in our hearts with them and uh, I felt like we were on the same page and finally 
when some of the real tests came, uh, we found ourselves uh, just kind of uh, banding together in fellowship and in prayer and getting our people together. Um, and then that led us uh, to make some de decisions with regard to our local churches. And then immediately we began to um, realize that uh, while we enjoyed good fellowship, our people and our own children, we had to do some thinking about them and about the future. And uh, we wanted our, our children to grow up, wanted our young people to have fellowship with like-minded folks in more than just the local church situation. So we decided to have uh, a camp meeting. Uh, the camp meeting, as I said, has always been our strength. From the time I was a little boy, uh, we attended camp meeting. And uh, so we decided to have the first uh, camp at the Decatur Church. And there's some people right here today that were in attendance in that very first camp. I think Sister Marie right. would. She was there, and Nadine uh, was there. Is there anybody else from Decatur area that was at that particular camp meeting? Okay, there's some others. And from Bloomington. Yes, from Bloomington. Right. Don't forget us, Jim. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that I, I well remember in those services, um, the old Decatur church had... Um, one, had the the heating system where they had cut a you know a rectangular uh, hole in the floor and had those hanging uh, uh, furnaces, but it also made the floor kind of weak. And to this day, I can remember when that place filled up and they were standing around the walls and around the back. There were nearly 300 people in that church, and uh, I was standing in the center aisle and I could feel the vibration in my feet any time anybody stepped down that center aisle and I thought what are we going to experience here I it really I thought we were you know that floor was weak and we were going to going to go through there was a there was more than tons of fun there I'll tell you that uh, but uh, anyway great crowds God came on the scene in those meetings and just solidified uh, our feeling and gave us direction from God um, and then uh, from there we decided uh, that uh, we couldn't do that very long because our crowd was growing so we rented the Ileana campground uh, down uh, on the Indiana Illinois border near Terre Haute um, had the tabernacle filled up uh, we uh, we lacked RV spaces but the farmer that was in charge of the of the committee that handled that campground said we we've got you taken care of said we've spent several hundred dollars improving the electrical at that time uh, Patsy and our kids we stayed in a tent on the hill back overlooking the creek and called mother-in-law's leap my mother-in-law appreciated that but uh, anyway it was a fantastic time and I remember uh, especially one significant thing uh, here was that new electrical system and it was shiny new in the dining hall they had a nice dining hall and the brother had just told us how much money they'd spent and how good it was updated and uh, we sat down to eat one noon meal, and we had more campers than what we had expected, uh, more RVs. And Brother Heron was sitting on my right, and the electrical outfit was running up the wall right behind us when all of a sudden there was popping and cracking up above. And I looked, and it was like a welder must have been working on the roof. There was uh, fiery uh, particles flying everywhere. Brother Heron's eyes got real big, and he jumped up, grabbed his tray, and uh, started away from there. And what had happened, we were pulling <laughs> so many amps uh, on that system that it arced inside, burnt the wire into, and we were out of electricity. Boy, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? We were out of electricity for a while till they could get some people out there to re restore that. So they finally told us, uh, you know, we've grown about as much as we're gonna grow here, so you're gonna have to find some other place. And so we contacted the, the friends and they said, uh, well, we'll add on to our tabernacle and, and we'll try to accommodate you folks. We were there for some time. They did add on sections onto the, uh, the auditorium there. But the last year we were there, we had as many as 150 people standing outside looking in the windows. They could not get in because of the crowd. In the meantime, we bought Mockingbird Hill Park that you saw the pictures of there a little bit ago and uh, prepared to you know, get our dining hall uh, we had to do that uh, and then take two or three years to, you know, to grow up to where it would handle our crowd. And then the time came when we overgrew that place, and so 11 camp meetings ago, we, uh, we landed in this place. 
Question number three is for both of you, but we'll start with you. What are some of your camp meeting highlights? Oh my, there's a number of them. I can well remember the camp meeting at Decatur and the crowds had gathered and Brother Sutherland renting a plane, taking us down to Ileana to look over the yards and I wanted to check my insurance policy before I got on board. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we went down, checked it out, and uh, decided to have camp meeting down there. But the first camp meeting on the Eliana grounds was when the New York Conference came out as we had petitioned them uh, to set us up as an autonomous conference. They agreed to do so. Brother Whitney came out, Brother Fay came out, and also Brother Bidwell came uh, to that conference. Brother Sutherland was going to be ordained. He went out to be ordained in New York. And uh, since they were going to set us up as a conference, they said, maybe you'd like to go back and be ordained in Ileana. So he agreed to that, and we did too. And uh, so we, that's, uh, we did not have a camp meeting in. We just had our conference. And that was our first conference. That was in 1967, and in the month of August. And uh, we had a great conference, great conference, and in that conference we ordained Brother Sutherland, I think Brother Walden, likewise, at the same time, uh, in that first conference on the Eliana campground. I, I remember those days real well, and uh, God came uh, just time and time again, and the crowds came. The altar services were just powerful, and I appreciated God's blessings and his presence. Uh, we, we moved from there to Muncie, and uh, I can remember highlights of Muncie days, we, you know, and what happened there. But I suppose some of the, some of the great highlights in, in uh, Anderson, you know, on the Mockingbird Hill Park, so they called it around there, was uh, when, uh, when we were able to raise enough money in four years' time to pay off the mortgage and the debt of the Mockingbird Hill Park, and we burnt the mortgage. And uh, Louis Russell and some of those rascals, they, they had planned to put me in the trash cart. And I saw that thing coming across the yard, and I knew where they were going, and where they were coming, rather, and I just got off the platform, went down, and crawled into it. And they began to push me around <laughs> that tabernacle. They had it out. They had it all wrong. Somebody put it in a paper that I was taking up money in a wheelbarrow. Well, that wasn't a bad idea <laughs> because right. we needed it. I'd take it up in anything I could find. <laughs> so uh, we, we were able to rejoice over that. I remember Bill Gaddis meeting me in, the, in that one outside aisle uh, towards the edge. To, I mean, coming down that side, <laughs> coming down with a pair of scissors, and he was coming down that, that aisle, and I wondered, what in the world is that guy doing with scissors in his hand and heading towards me? And boy, he stopped, and he said, Brother Gray, would you do something for me? And I said, what do you want, Bill? I was never a good barber. You ask my boys and ask my wife. But uh, he said, I want you to cut this ponytail off, uh, off of me. He said, that's my last identity to the old crowd. And man, I went to work and cut that ponytail off and handed that thing to him. And it wasn't long, a few years later, another guy came. He thought I was a pretty good barber, and I cut his off. <laughs> but we, we remember some great times. God blessing, the place was packed, and God was on the scene. And that was the main thing. The preachers preached powerful, powerful in that place. The children's services with the Victory Trio right. were the, I mean, it was just a real tremendous blessing. And I thank God for my memories of all from Decatur uh, to Ileana uh, to Muncie and also to the Anderson Malkinbird Park. And I hated to think that we had to leave there, but we couldn't get any ground to build on and so on. We did expand the tabernacle, but that was packed out and hot, hot, hot. Can you remember? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but he that endureth to the end shall be blessed. All right, but uh, great days.
great days at the at the camp meeting, and God marvelously helped financially. Right. One thing I remember um, on the maybe the humorous side, uh, Brother Scott was an evangelist, and um, Brother Darnell. Now, if you are on the platform and it's Brother Darnell's turn to preach, Brother Darnell focuses only on the fact that he's got to preach and everybody else get out of the way. He gets nervous when anybody would think about infringing on that time. And um, anyway, we had over at the Parsonage, we'd, we'd laughed about some tapes we'd heard and uh, about a radio preacher. And uh, what was funny, about every other night, it came time for Brother Scott to preach, and he'd say, I'd like for Betty to come to the piano before I preach tonight. And uh, she would come to the piano, and he would, they'd, he'd sing some song and end up having an altar service, and he didn't get to preach. That kind of worried Brother Darnell. Um, he preached every time he was supposed to. But uh, anyway, we were, I'll never forget, I was sitting here, and Brother Darnell was right over here, and, and uh, the people were beginning to get blessed, and somebody was testifying, and it was starting to put a little pressure on his time and uh, he got to shuffling his feet and, and rubbing his leg with his hands and finally looked over and said boy you know if they're going to shout I hope they just take the whole service <laughs> and uh, I said oh come on brother Darnell everything's going to be just fine he said well he said uh, I can't preach in no 15 minutes <laughs> and I'd heard that before we laughed about that that was what that radio preacher said and then he said and I can't sing <laughs> So he was referring to his fellow evangelist who hadn't preached a lot but sang a lot. Um, but uh, anyway, that was a tremendous blessing. And then uh, Dr. Omar Lee is, uh, is one of my heroes in the pulpit. Uh, he preaches with, you know, kind of a textbook type message that you could almost print when he gets done. I mean, his English and his um, outlines and his method is, uh, is really precious. And, uh, and he acknowledged the fact that he had never preached more, I think he said, than 35 minutes. And I'll never forget one morning when there must have been nearly 900 to 1,000 people there. And the glory of the Lord settled down and he was preaching, exalting the blood of Christ. He was talking about the Lamb of God. And he got to a certain point. It was, it, you could just feel God just vibrating in the place. And I remember he got out, and in those days we fed him the mic. And I was feeding him the, the line, you know, and he'd gone out there so far. And he was just beside himself. And uh, he got to a point where people just began to shout and run the aisles. And, and they were shouting him down. Nobody could hear what he was saying. And finally he turned around, sweat was pouring off of him. And he looked at me and he said, I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> I said, just pour it on. And uh, that day, uh, while he was preaching, I saw something I'd never seen before. There were people running the aisles and turning the corner and shouting. Maybe ten folks running. I think Melvin Beecher was one of them. Anyway, running back through there as hard as they could. At the same time, there was eight or ten people weeping coming down the aisle to seek God before he was through preaching. What a wonderful demonstration of glory. And uh, we kind of checked the time and, and formed Brother... Omar Lee, that you have broken the all-time record this morning. You have preached for 41 minutes. And uh, what a time. I've seen him since then many times, and we always talk about those special services where God came uh, in that camp. This question is also for both of you. So, Brother Gray, we'll start with you. Uh, in the last 40 years, there's been many, many evangelists for camp. And could you just sort of give us a rundown of some of those? Just some that come to mind. All right, the first, first evangelist to the camp was uh, a Reverend McLaren, and he, uh, he spoke at Decatur in our first camp. I believe the second evangelist uh, might have been, uh, was it D.P. Denton? I think D.P. Denton uh, was our second evangelist. We had uh, uh, Brother Johnson of the Bible uh, Missionary Church, and he spoke in one of our camps. I don't remember which one. Uh, I believe O.L. Fay was there for a camp. And um, I didn't, if I'd have known this question was coming on, I would have gone back to the archive.
thank Paul Gray for helping us on this. Uh, since 1978, we had Monty Mahoney, Millard Downing, Edgar Billman, V.O. Egan, J.D. Young, G.R. French, John White. Now, that's a familiar name. John White and Paul Pierpoint, H.E. Smool, R.E. Carroll, Noel Scott, Dale Yoakum, Omar Lee, Marshall Smart, Earl Newton, James Keaton, Wayne States, Orlo Webb, uh, Richard Humble, D.P. Denton, Robert England, Brother A.J. Whitney, uh, Judy Williams, Carl Eisenhart, Daniel Stetler, H.E. Darnell, Mike Weatherall, Ken Fay, Rick Yancey, uh, B.J. Walker, uh, Dr. Paul Kaufman, um, Brother Roland Mitchell, uh, and uh, Leonard Sankey. And in singers, that's important, the Keith Sheridan family, Ben and Sue Colburn, Paul and Nancy Gray, uh, the Thomas Gray team, Dave and Francis Fuller, the Edwards family, uh, Bud Dunn family, the Victory Trio, the Henry Miller family, uh, Jerry Glick and his family, Larry Thomas and their family, uh, George and Ruth Vernon, and um, Don Quayle's family. So there's a good uh, rundown, quite a, quite a list of them. Brother Gray, this question's for you. Can you give us an idea of what were some of the first organized churches? All right, as it's already been stated, Bloomington was the first one, and then Decatur was organized. And uh, after Decatur, it was Evansville, uh, Indiana. Reverend John Yant was the pastor there. And uh, Petersburg, Indiana, and uh, that is, uh, that's a historical point I won't bring out here if you want to talk to me in private. My wife said, declared after that meeting she'd never go with me again to organize a church. <laughs> <laughs> but it was quite exciting, and sometimes you never know what you're going to be running into. So uh, at least uh, some of those were our first, uh, Mason, Illinois, and um, let's see, Mason, and also Springfield, uh, and Onarga. Yes, Onarga, and uh, that was quite one. Uh, really, that one started, uh, was moved out of the original building, and they went out to the cemetery. But they didn't die. They stayed alive. And uh, I remember going out there and holding, uh, holding annuals and meetings with those people at, in Onarga. It was exciting. Brother Sutherland, in speaking of our history, does the name Pilgrim Prod ring any bells? I'm afraid it does. That was the, uh, the granddaddy of the Pilgrim. Um, it was kind of a, a humorous name, but it was intended to uh, kind of give us information and also to prod the pilgrims to keep on moving on. Um, I, I, I noticed, um, and by the way, if anybody has a copy of the minutes that go all the way back, uh, I would love, when we get our new building up, we're going to have an office in there, and I would love to have every one of those minutes in the archives. Uh, it's really interesting, uh, the things that were voted on, some of those early ones had pictures that are now priceless to me right now. I noticed uh, one that I had and looked at this morning was in, in uh, I believe it was 1982. Uh, there were 10 churches that were started during that time. And uh, one thing I appreciated, there were several young preachers that, that launched out in different places to do pioneer work. Now, not all those churches survived. And the encouraging thing about that is not one of the Apostle Paul's churches are surviving today. So, you know, people live, people die, and there's transition, but the gospel just keeps on, keeps on going. But one of the outcomes of that year, uh, we organized the church at Westfield, Indiana, and it, we were also able later when a pastor from Noblesville came to us and said, uh, you know, why don't we just put the two congregations together? And uh, I'm going to tell you, that's a tricky thing to accomplish. Uh, with two strong preachers and uh, but anyway the Lord helped us over a period of several months there and uh, to bring together and make it possible for what is now the uh, Noblesville Church which has become one of the strongest churches in the conference so uh, I just praise God for those that we started we need to start some more and uh, that God will help us as we begin another 
40 years that uh, we'll see some uh, some more works um, started. But the prod, uh, it was kind of a primitive attempt uh, to try to inform our people and to kind of stimulate us along, keep us together, so forth. Brother Gray, can you give us uh, sort of a little history on this, the beginning of Pilgrim Missions? I think maybe I might. Uh, I, the wife and I and the family was singing in a camp up in Rock Lake, uh, Michigan, and uh, we were called to be singers that year. And while I was there, Brother and Sister Range, Brother Range, asked me if I would serve on his board on the stake side. And I said, well, I guess I don't know what I can add to it, but uh, if you need me, I'll try to do my best. And uh, at the very first meeting that I met with that board, they were discussing how to, the funds and how to raise more money, how to get, you know, to have that support. And so I thought for a minute, we had just, uh, uh, we were uh, supporting a mission field, and then because of various reasons on the field, we decided no longer to support that field and go that way, and we were uh, without a missionary outlet. And uh, so I asked them, I said, Are you, it, would you be interested in bringing your work uh, under an organization? I said, I think I know of one that would be more than anxious if things worked out and we could. And uh, Brother Raines, he kind of thought of me, well, maybe we would. We had explored at least and think it over. I said, well, why don't you meet with the council and we'll talk. And I called, I called Brother Sutherland, and uh, I was his assistant at that time. And uh, so we set up a meeting in Fort Wayne, Indiana, at uh, Redmond, Brother Redmond's home. And we met there with the Raines, and we got to talking and exploring and... Uh, out of that, they decided to bring their work in under the shelter of the Pilgrim Holiness Church. And as far as I know, that was, that was our beginning of the work in Dominica, which I have enjoyed going down there, and I want to make one more trip down there. I, I just love it. I just love it. That's a shot in the arm. I can remember um, we had, uh, I believe, the, the very first camp meeting that we had as a pilgrim camp in Dominica. I had the privilege of, of going down and um, living in the home with Brother and Sister Rains and uh, then seeing God do some fantastic things. I, as I mentioned, I believe it was yesterday, one of the real tremendous benefits of all of that and the culmination of that took place to me last year when uh, they, we had the rally and we were honoring Brother and Sister Rains for the years of service that they had rendered in Dominica. And uh, I'll never forget seeing that bus come rolling in there and uh, the people from the Care Reserve and Petra Safrie, I believe, and some of those people uh, come, you know, get, getting off of the bus and they represented like three generations of pilgrims, of people that originally got saved when the Rains and our other missionaries were there and now their children, and then their children's children. Uh, it just was an absolute um, beautiful illustration of how the gospel should work. And it was also a real um, an honor to Brother and Sister Rains to see their spiritual children producing uh, more spiritual children. And uh, what a tremendous blessing. And they've, they've been a blessing for years. I, I've kidded them. Um, I call them the wind and the rain. Um, I can remember uh, times when... I went to visit the mission field, took Brother Atwell with me. Because the plane was going to be late, they wouldn't let us fly in that runway because it didn't have runway lights to this day. You cannot go in there after dark. So we had to stop in Guadalupe, and we had to find a place to stay, which was in a kind of a basement-type place owned by a missionary. And uh, Brother Atwell was there with me, and, and uh, we were kind of getting ready for the night's rest. And uh, anyway, Brother... Uh, Atwell came out of the restroom, got in bed, and uh, anyway, I, I slipped in there, and, and all of a sudden, I heard this awful carrying on out there. And Brother Atwell's up in the middle of the bed, hollering, yeah, 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 yeah. And I said, what is wrong with you? And he was pointing. He couldn't talk. He was pointing, and there was the biggest uh, 
um, centipede I had ever seen in my life crawling down the wall. I mean, the thing was like six or seven inches long and still coming. And I said to him, what's wrong with you? I said, man, wouldn't you hate to buy a pair of shoes for a family of them? And uh, now nah, he said, <laughs> he said, that thing's dangerous. And anyway, I went over and, and I said, we'll cure him. And that thing reared back like this, boy. And I flipped him on the nose. And he turned around and crawled and disappeared. And we finally settled down and got some sleep. Brother Atwell still mumbled about that. We got over to the Raines' house and went to sit down to eat. And we were telling them about this. Sister Raines turned and looked at me and said, Brother Sutherland, are you crazy? I said, what's the problem? She said, those things are deadly, like a rattlesnake. If that thing had bit you, you'd have been in the hospital for two weeks or probably died. And I said, well, God protects the ignorant. But uh, anyway, it, uh, what a tremendous blessing. I can see Brother Rain sitting over reading a book and hear Sister Rain fluttering around the kitchen telling all the things that we can't do and this and that and the other. And she's excited. And it was fun. He's reading his book only to put it down and said, we are not going to do that. Went on back reading his book. <laughs> and after all these years, they're still at it. We still love them. They're special people. Praise the Lord. Uh, for the last question, Brother Southern, I'll direct it to you. Uh, you remember well when my parents came into the Pilgrims in 82, and this was the only conference, I have, the only church I've ever been a member of, was the Pilgrim Church. And I have kids that I'm raising to be pilgrims and want them to remain holiness. And as you think of our young people, what we see here today, what is your vision for the future of the Pilgrim Holiness Church? I think, first of all, the thing that we need to take away from here is to put the spiritual aspect of our conference first. I think we need to personally um, look to God and make some commitments ourselves to go from here as God whether he wakes us up in the night or we get up an extra 30 minutes or an hour early and find a secret place to pray. Uh, pray for our families. Pray for each other. And then pray that God will help us in our conference family and help us as we uh, accept the challenge of establishing a, a place, a place for us. We've got to have God's help. It's not a matter of just business. It's a matter of having the direction and the blessing of God. And one of the things that, that just keeps me awake at night is when I see these precious children that we had here, these fine young people that we have here, the youth camp had a profound effect on me uh, this year as I watched 147 of them um, uh, begin to seek God and to see how God used uh, Brother Ziegler and Sister Leanne and, and that wonderful staff of people. Uh, and it was spiritual. That's the thing. We saw the pictures where there was fun and there was the humor. And, and uh, hey, we all need a touch of youth always. Never outgrow it. But at the same time, it was, it was amazing the depth of spiritual hunger and appetite that was there and the studying of the Word of God. These kids take home with them some challenges from the Word that they haven't had in all their life. And I praise God for that. But we've got to make a provision for them. You know, it's shocking. You look at some of those older pictures and some of you were little kids. Now I see you. You're chasing a bunch of little kids around this campground. And the next thing you know, these little ones that you see here, they're going to be having kids. And I think we have a tremendous responsibility to minister to those that are behind us. We don't want to have uncertain footprints to leave for them. We want to maintain the standards of separation from the world. Uh, you look at this list of evangelists, they're some of the greatest in the world. They're good, solid, holiness people that have held a standard. You look at the singers. We want to continue to do that and guard our platform the way wholeness people ought to. At the same time, there's some tremendous sacrifices that our people have made historically. We took a big bite when we took Mockingbird Hill. But history and prayer and God's direction has proven we can do it. And uh, at this point, we stand on the verge of some brand new things. And you've heard me talk about it all camp meeting. But we need to rise to the occasion and finish what we've started and go through the next phase. We're going to do it in bite-sized portions. We just need more people to take a bigger bite. Amen. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Now, in the providence of God, 
You know, God takes a, uh, takes a lemon situation, sour situations. Maybe the devil intended to hurt us, and he can turn that into lemonade. Uh, I just marvel at what God did for us this past week on Thursday uh, when we had received the information that it's possible that the Wesleyan folks would rent us the grounds at Frankfurt. Frankfurt always rings a bell to some of us because we spent a good chunk of our life there in Bible college. Uh, but uh, anyway, we explored that and found that they were generous and, and actually did everything they could to make it acceptable for us to come for a year or two. And um, anyway, we, uh, we came back to the grounds on the way back. I stood up in, in that bus and we talked about the pros and cons of what we were to do. And we decided before we pulled back in these grounds that we would, we would be going there next year. We got back here and within 45 minutes, uh, I got the news. We were informed that we didn't really have much of a choice about coming back. That uh, they were going to terminate the contract and uh, they felt like that we had outgrown this place and we needed to move on. And the manager uh, told Brother Leach, he said, you know, there's a campground over in Frankfort, Indiana that you all ought to look at. Well, we just got back from there. And uh, anyway, we got a call the next morning after they had met their district council, and at a wonderful rate, they decided that we could rent the place, lease the place, and have our youth camp there and our big camp there next year. And uh, so we praise God for that. In the meantime, we still have, we're getting close. Uh, just yesterday, those offerings, last night, remember I made the little appeal, uh, we got $135 a month pledged and then a $1,000 one-time gift. That $1,000 and those $500 and all of those uh, uh, pledges, they're telling us loud and clear, we're ready to help, we're ready to do that. But um, I want to uh, make a special appeal this morning I'd like for you to renew your 2524 membership. And we could apply every bit of that into continuing to develop the campground and pay for the building and the mortgage and those things and move along to the next phase until the time's going to come shortly when we will need that space and that building and that dining hall and we'll have our own grounds. And um, I just look forward to that time. Thank you, gentlemen. Brother Clements, could I make some, uh, just a few parting remarks? All right. I, I thank God almost daily for the privilege that he has allowed wife and I to work with various ones on this conference. I did not deserve, some of them made me look so good that I was ashamed of myself, but how I appreciated them standing by and all I need to do is just ask them, and they were right there to do it. My fellow co-workers uh, throughout the period of times that I have been conference president and being involved, uh, Brother Sneed, uh, Brother Sutherland, uh, after a few years he came back and from the school, and he became my assistant. Brother Sneed worked years as my assistant while I was in, yes. and even Brother Lemon. And uh, I, I just appreciate the men that God allowed me. And then the council has been tremendous, tremendous. And I'm in debt to these type of individuals that have left me. Uh, even though I was called conference president, I could do nothing without the help of God and without the he help of these that God allowed to be a part of me. And I just thank God for what he has allowed me and I said, if I go to Frankfurt, I'll probably say, Lord, let thy servant depart in peace. <laughs> Amen. I'd like for us all to stand at this time. And uh, our pastors and preachers, if you want to go back down, we're not quite finished yet, but if you want to go back down, I'd like to have some the music to, all, to uh, Amazing Grace. Brother, if you'll lead us in that um, so you can proceed to uh, make your way down uh, and be seated, and then we'll have a something else to talk about here in just a little bit. Amen.
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind. 